Oh, this is wonderful. It's such a big crowd. Oh, this is great. Um, I'm so excited for this evening. I can't wait to hear the story. So thank you for joining us this evening as the Jake Mangini Museum presents the 1913 ship disaster, the Volturno. Our area has ties to the Volturno as members of two local families, the DeGroots and the Grenneville, survived the disaster. And how special. With us this evening, our descendants, Carol, Guyan, I'm sorry, it's, it's, it's so different from the way it's spelled, Guyan, and, um, and Jeanette Zahasky, Zahasky, see, okay. sorry, uh, and to each tell us the moving accounts of their grandparents' rescue and ordeal aboard the Volturno. I think we're going to begin, though, with, uh, the, uh, with the short video. Disaster can strike at any time. One minute, it's just another day. A split second later, lives are changed forever. There's an old saying that misery loves company. This is never more true than during one black week in October 1913. October 1913. Europe and the world is experiencing a period of great change. It's a period during which uh, new industries and new technologies are transforming social existence. The telegraph, uh, wireless communication, it's a period of immense population growth and of movement of people from countryside to city and from Europe to the new world. Europe is undergoing very rapid industrialization and urbanization. So people's lives, are, in some cases, are being changed by these kind of forces. And Europe's obviously moving in the sense that a lot, large portion of Europe's population are changing their residence in various ways. Immigrants from all parts of Europe are looking for a new life in the new world. Many are trying to escape extreme poverty, rigid social division, and religious persecution. Add to this the fact that competition between shipping lines was depressing the cost of the passage, and that again helps to explain why there were so many migrants. October 2nd, 1913. The steamship Volturno leaves the Dutch port of Rotterdam. Built as a cargo boat in 1906, it also carries passengers, with a stopover in Halifax and New York. Volturno was a very hard-working tramp. Not a luxury liner. Rather, she was there for the working class and for the regular trade of carrying cargoes and people economically across the North Atlantic. Captain Francis Inch is in charge of the 93 crewmen on board. This is his first command a position he has held for only a month. His first officer is H.P. Miller from New York. Miller's wife is also at sea, on her way home from visiting relatives in England. She is on another passenger ship, the Kroonland, because of a rule which forbids wives from sailing on the same ship as their husbands. The Volturno carries enough lifeboats and rafts for 1,000 occupants. On this trip, there are just half that many passengers, 562. They're going on a long sea voyage, um, of which they have no experience at all. I mean, most of these people have never left the village before they travel across the Atlantic. Frida Greyboys is among them, sailing to New York with her young son and daughter to meet her husband, who left Russia eight months earlier. The, the ones that came over in the Volturno was my grandmother, Frida, my dad, Nissel, and my Aunt Clara, or Creva, according to the manifest, they were uh, steerage passengers. And, and from other information I have that, uh, from other sources, said everybody stayed in cabins of one sort or another. A young office clerk from Germany also travels in steerage. His name is Walter Trentopol, and this is one sea voyage he will never forget. October 9th. The Volturno is in the mid-Atlantic, 600 miles from where the Titanic went down the year before. Seas have been rough for the past few hours. 
but Captain Inch is not concerned. The Volturno has weathered many storms in her time, and she can weather this one. Most passengers are still asleep in their cabins when ship steward Willie Reiswich makes his rounds at 6 a.m. He finds nothing out of the ordinary. In her hold in the forward part of the ship, the Volturno carries a large cargo of chemicals, wines and liquors, straw mats and barrels of oil. But there is something else there, waiting for its chance to escape. 6.40 a.m. A crew member reports a strong smell of smoke coming from the number one hold. Captain Inch is alerted while crew members spray water in the direction of the smoke. First, the captain was informed that there was a fire. Then he said, let's uh, not warn the passengers, but try to fight it. In their cabin, Frida Greyboys and her two children hear the commotion. They weren't the first ones to discover a fire, but when they learned about the fire, then my dad uh, said that he went and knocked on cabin doors, waking up people to get them out of their cabins so they can get to safety. Back in the hold, Willie Reiswitz and the others are trying to put the fire out, but they are about to lose the battle. A little after 7 o'clock, there was a terrific roar and a sheet of flame shot out that threw us all back. The tables and benches and steerage were blown up, and the bulkhead caved in so that we could see the flames in number one hole. The captain realized that he needed help, and he turned to the wireless, which had recently figured so prominently in the story of the Titanic in an effort to bring other ships. 78 miles away, the Cunard passenger liner, the Carmania, receives the Volturno's first SOS. Her captain, James Barr, orders full steam ahead. But for some of the passengers and crew of the Volturno, that will be too late. As they join the stampede up the stairs, Frida Greyboys and her children feel the push of the crowd. Walter Trentifold sees fellow passengers trampled underfoot or dragged back so another can take their place. The passengers came up and the fire just spread. At one point, I think, there was nothing separating uh, them just except one iron floor, and the rest was like a furnace burning there. Uh, since the fire was at the forward end, so the passengers escaped to the back of the ship. There was panic, so some people started to jump overboard. People just preferred to die by drowning and die by fire. With the storm still raging, Captain Inch orders the launch of several lifeboats. Chief Officer H.P. Miller is put in charge of the first one over the side. One of the things that struck me is uh, them putting those boats in the water with the seas being so heavy. It's extremely difficult to, to put a boat in the water in heavy seas. As Miller's boat reaches the water, a wave flips it over. Officer Miller is able to climb back in with several others, but without oars to guide her, he can only hold on as the boat is swept out to sea. Other lifeboats meet a similar fate. One is crushed like an egg under the ship's hull. Another makes it to the water, but follows Miller's boat out to sea and disappears. The attempt to launch the lifeboats in an angry sea costs more than 100 lives. Captain Inch receives word by wireless that the Cunard passenger liner, the Carmania, is on its way. The message may well be the Volturno's last. As fire claws its way across the Volturno, Walter Trentapole fights his way to the deck. He is shocked by the chaos he finds. The loss of the lifeboats pushes many passengers to the brink. In desperation, one woman jumps overboard with her baby. There's also a story of a French young couple. They uh, embraced, they gave each other a farewell kiss, and in an embrace they jumped overboard and drowned. As hysteria sweeps through the crowd, Frida Greyboys is surprisingly calm. She decided she wasn't going to risk her life, you know, running like a lot of people were running. 
And she decided she wasn't going to do that. She was going to sit and wait it out until somebody came along and rescued them. As more passengers push into the ship's aft, Frida realizes she must protect her son and daughter. My grandmother then gathered him and, and my aunt up and took them back aft to the rope locker where they store the, the ropes and stuff. And so uh, she hid them in there to be away from the crowd. When she returns, Frida notices a change in the mood of those around her. The Carmania has been sighted on the horizon four hours after receiving the Volturno's SOS. As his ship positions itself for rescue operations, Carmania Captain James Barr orders the launch of one of his lifeboats, manned by a crew of 10. They know the pearl that the people in the Volturno were in, and they, they were willing to give their lives to, to, to attempt to get them off right away. The lifeboat is buffeted by the raging sea. Seven out of the ten oars are broken or lost. After two hours, it returns to the Carmania empty-handed. It had to be a traumatic time for the people aboard the ship and the rescuing people not being able to get to the other ship and, and uh, get lines onto the other ship and things like that. I'm, I'm sure they were saying their prayers. By six that evening, three more ships respond to the call. All try to lower lifeboats, but the seas are too rough. The third ship is the Kroonland, a passenger liner from the Red Star Fleet, also bound for New York from Antwerp. One of its passengers, the wife of First Officer H.P. Miller, watches the Volturno burn, unaware that her husband is already among the dead. By 6.30 p.m., brass work and glass on the Volturno has melted, and much of the woodwork has burned and collapsed. Only a steel barrier separates the passengers on deck from the inferno seething in the hold below. In desperation, Captain Inch asks for volunteers to launch another lifeboat. His intent is to show the other ship captains that a boat can survive the boiling seas. There are five volunteers, including ship steward Willie Reiswitz. They battle wind and waves for over an hour, but eventually reach the Grosser Kerfurst. They were put on board on a ladder, a rope ladder, which was left down. And immediately after, uh, that lifeboat crushed against the big ship. Uh, they just managed to get them in time. By 9 p.m., searchlights on the Carmania help illuminate the area as more ships answer the call. In total, 10 ships come to the rescue on their way to New York from Liverpool, Bramerhaven, and La Havre. But they have all arrived too late to save the Volturno. October 9, 1913, 9.30 p.m. Another explosion rocks the Volturno as fire reaches explosives on the ship's bridge. In a panic, German office clerk Walter Trentapol jumps into the ocean with another passenger and a member of the crew. And he first swam to the grocer first the German ship, but no one heard him because of the sea being so wild. Trentopol and the other men swim for the Carmania, but when a searchlight finds him in the water close to the ship, Walter Trentopol is alone. And he managed to get on board. The others were just too fatigued and they just went with the current, so they didn't make it. For those left on the Volturno, the night is long, dark, and frightening. For some, it is tragic. And there was a woman carrying her baby in her arms that fell asleep against the rail. And when she woke up, the baby had gone. It had rolled off the ship. Encouraged by the rescue of Trentopol and the others, several ships eventually send lifeboats close enough to the Volturno to urge survivors to jump. There was a woman also with a child, and she uh, threw her child overboard, hoping that it would go into the boat. It didn't, it fell into the sea. But there was one 
man in that lifeboat who reacted instantly, jumped in and finally did save that small baby. When morning arrives on October 10th, a firestorm still rages on the deck of the Volturno, but the storm at sea has passed. The oil tanker Narragansett begins pumping hundreds of tons of oil around the burning vessel. The heavy weight of the oil keeps the uh, water down from, in the way from breaking too much. And then you're able to get your boats into the water better and, and with less chance of them being turned over. And after that happened, I guess then they were able to affect the rescue. As Captain Inch begins separating the passengers into two groups, Frida Greyboys rushes to the Volturno's supply closet to retrieve her children. They heard that uh, when they were going to be rescued, that they were going to separate the men and the women. And so she dressed my dad up as a girl so that she can keep them together. And she told me when the, finally when they came to rescue, she had to go down on ropes. Her hands got drawn and the skin got raw from, you know, climbing down, you know, clasping the rope tight in her hands. It must have been a terrible experience. But she's very fortunate that she got off safely. 520 passengers and crew are taken off the Volturno that October morning. Captain Francis Inch and the two wireless operators are the last to leave. And they were picked up by all those various ships, which then, of course, also had different destinations. So they wound up in different ports. Some went, were on the way to the United States, but most of them were on the way to Europe. Frida Greyboys and her children are brought back to Rotterdam. Eventually, arrangements are made for them to take another ship to New York. Something that I thought was a coincidence is that although my grandfather came over seven months before them, they ended up both coming on the same ship. He came on the Campanello, and then because of the incident, here, here they come on the Campanello. So many families were separated. Uh, so the mother might have lost her children and worried for days where they were. A total of 136 lives are lost but many believe the number would have been higher if not for firefighting efforts that kept the burning ship afloat. And if not for wireless technology, the fate of the Volturno would have been one of the world's great mysteries. The need to have wireless, the need to call for assistance, which had been so heavily underscored with the loss of the Titanic, was now augmented by the burning of Volturno and the rescue of so many people. The cause of the fire is never determined, although speculation includes everything from spontaneous combustion to sabotage. But it's reported that the crew had, I think, an argument uh, over their wages or working conditions with the owners. And uh, the owner then reported that we got threatening letters, and just seven days after that letter, the Volturno gets uh, on fire in mid-Atlantic. Seven days after the rescue, the Volturno sinks into the ocean to its final resting place, but its legacy lives on. I think one of the things they learned from the Volturno disaster, you don't take a dangerous cargo like volatile chemicals and easily burnable materials and put them on a ship with so many hundreds of people. Ultimately, there came a segregation of dangerous cargoes and passengers that hitherto had not existed. The Volturno disaster quickly becomes an international story, but it is only the beginning, a mere introduction to a week of terrible news. Like I said, there was a lot of information out there, and uh, I really, really was working a lot, checking out different things, a lot of contradictions on the different newspapers, so I had to kind of compile it, and I wrote an article of what I thought had happened. The Volturno Sea disaster was the second one within 18 months. It was a very different class of ship than the luxurious Titanic. The Volturno, skippered by Captain Francis Inch, was a combination passenger and cargo ship and not luxurious at all. The 3,600 ton off Ocean Liner left Rotterdam on October 2nd, 1913 and was only halfway 
of the 1,000 mile journey to America on October 9th because of its heavy load and severe weather. The captain had slowed the ship down because of the weather. The cargo it carried was very combustible. There was 125 drums and 207 casts of chemicals. 90 drums and 740 casts of various kinds of oils. 559 casts plus 1,003 cases of wines. 310 cases of liqueurs, along with much more flammable materials. There also was a vast amount of coal on board needed to keep the steamer going. There were limited first class accommodations on the Volturno. Only 24 of the passengers were first class. Most of the passengers were immigrants. They were the steerage or third class passengers who paid a smaller fare for the voyage. Their ticket price was 15 to $30 with a half price for their children. Their accommodations were long rooms called the steerage rooms with multiple cots stacked sometimes three high and very close together. These rooms were in the part of the ship that was very noisy and very hot with no portal for light or ventilation. There were no regulations to follow at that time so the shipping companies <coughs> would cram as many steerage passengers into available space as possible. These passengers seldom complained because it was the cheapest way for them to immigrate to what they believed would be a better life. The only passengers from Holland aboard the ship were the de Groot Grunewald family members, Carol's and my great-grandmother, along with her daughter and grand my grandfather's sister, and her four small children were immigrating to America to meet with family members who were already there. Had it not been for Marconi, the inventor of the wireless, there would have been no survivors. Instead of 525, 21 survivors, there would have been 657 deceased. There is an interesting story about one of the wireless operators. His name was Christopher Pennington, a young man in his 20s. He had a horrifying dream about the ship being on fire in the middle of the ocean during a terrifying storm. He could see himself at the wireless making frantic calls for help. He said he saw panic arise and passengers jumping overboard to try to save themselves, themselves, but instead ending up in a watery grave. In his dream, six ships came to their rescue after, rescue after jumping overboard himself. He was rescued by one of them. There were nine ships that came to rescue the Volturno passengers, plus the oil tanker. That was the only difference from the, from the six arriving ships in Pennington's dream. Pennington was so terrified by his dream that he asked to be reassigned to another ship. But the shipping company said a dream was no excuse, and the change of assignment was re refused. At 6.55 a.m. on October 13th, smoke from the fire was first seen from the forward hatch. Captain Inch was notified. The standard shipboard procedure of fighting fire was started but had unexpected results. An explosion scattered and spread the fire rapidly to the cargo. Flooding the hold was out of the question because the cargo was so heavy, Captain Inch knew that the ship would sink if they added more water. It was never positively known how the fire started. There had been many, been many different versions of the story. One version was that one of the chemicals in the cargo was superoxide barium. It was very combustible. And it was thought that because of the high seas, it was exposed to friction, resulting in it to ignite. Another version of how the fire started was a passenger was smoking a cigarette. He was being approached by a crew member, and if he got caught, he would be fined $5. So he dropped the cigarette in a hole on the deck, and it fell into the cargo hold. Pennington began tapping out SOS signals on the wireless. Within seconds, there was an answer. The Carmania, headed for Ireland, tapped back, we're coming. The sea's intensity increased, whipping flames that burned through the antenna fasteners. A sailor was able to refasten the antenna so SOS 
signals could continue to be sent. It was stated in many of the articles that the rescue boats of Volturno were not in good condition and that there were not enough life vests for everyone. The fire was increasing and the sea was becoming angrier, but despite this, Captain Inch decided to launch the lifeboats. He hoped that the passengers would have a better chance for survival in a lifeboat being picked up by ships that were answering the SOS calls, then burning on the ship. The first class passengers insisted they go first. The first boat was sent down with 25 people in it. It capsized immediately when it hit the waves. The passengers were last seen thrashing around and never seen again. The second boat was launched. It managed to stay afloat. Its passengers waved the, to the grim-faced passengers on the ship. The lifeboat floated away though and was never seen again. Another lifeboat was lowered. It made it to the water, but huge waves swept it under the liner into the propellers, grinding the boat and passengers to pieces. The passengers on the ship were becoming frantic and hysterical after seeing the tragedy. Captain Inch and his officers were able to keep the bad situation from getting completely out of control. The Carmania was 75 miles away from the Volturno. Other ships were answering the calls for help. In all, nine vessels turned off their courses and headed for the Volturno. They were American, German, Russian, English, and French ships. Captain Inch decided not to lower any more lifeboats after seeing the disasters of the previous one. When hearing this, a small group of seamen and immigrants took it upon themselves to launch a boat. But tra tragedy struck quickly. Before they even made it to the water, the lines twisted and dumped them into the sea. They were disappeared under the waves. The fire was increasingly getting worse. Captain Inch told the wireless operators to put out a plea for an oil tanker. He hoped the waves could be calmed by the oil. At 6 p.m., Pennington received a message from the captain of an Anglo-American tanker, Narragansett. He responded, we'll be there with the milk in the morning. That was the last time Pennington used the wireless. Just before noon, the Carmania arrived. Its captain, knowing that lifeboat work was dangerous on the high seas, still wanted to try a rescue. Captain Barr launched a lifeboat, and for two hours they fought to get near the Volturno, but the wind and the high seas would hurl the boat away whenever they got near it. They finally gave up and were happy to make it back to the Carmania. The other rescue ships arrived throughout the day. Night fell and most of the rescue ships decided to wait until morning to try rescuing Volturno's passengers. But by midnight, the captain of the grocer, Kurfgust, could not stand to see the burning spectacle any longer. A small group of hardy seamen manned a lifeboat and headed toward the, dark, the Volturno in the darkness. They circled the fiercely burning steamer while they shouted to the passengers to jump. They yelled, Schnell, Schnell, but no one would jump in the darkness. At dawn, the oil tanker arrived. The captain of the tanker immediately went to work. Although he had never used oil to try to calm the seas before, he had no doubt of its ability to do the job. He pumped on the lee side so the wall turtle would drift over the broad expanse of oil and float surrounded completely by oiled water. He used two four-inch hoses and poured out between 20 and 30 tons of heavy, non-flammable oil. Talk about an oil spill. The effects of the oil broke the fierce seas, leaving a smooth swell. The rescue ships moved quickly and the miracle began. Captain Inch encouraged some passengers to jump overboard to hurry up the rescue, but they were afraid so the captain invited his crew to do it, to show the passengers it was safe and they would be rescued. Many of them did, including Christopher Pennington. All were saved by the lifeboats. Other crew members and passengers then jumped after seeing that those who went before them had been saved. 
There were no less than 35 lifeboats around the Volturn or rescuing passengers at that passengers at that time. Many passengers were still on the ship. Captain Inch ordered the men to stand behind a rope he had laid out. He said, women and children first. Many of the men then decided it was a good idea to jump overboard to get saved by the lifeboats. Crew members flung heavy cargo nets over the side of the ship and formed human ladders down the lines. Passengers were then passed from hand to hand down into the boats waiting below. The last to leave was Captain Inch, his officers, the cook, and Captain Inch's dog, Jack. The time was 8 o'clock a.m., which was 25 hours after the first SOS was sent out. Captain Inch could not see. The film over his eyeballs had dried doing dirt due to the stifling hot air of the flames hitting him in the face as he was doing his unbelievable job. He was blind for four days, but thankfully got his eyesight back. Ten little babies, some, some under a year old, all scantily dressed and some only wrapped in a blanket, were taken aboard the La Terrine. These babies were separated from their parents. The women from the first class on the La Terrine were quite anxious to care for them. They turned their staterooms into nurseries where they bathed, fed, and put makeshift clothing on the babies. They tore up their own garments made of expensive materials to sew clothes for the babies. Some of the women had never had a needle in their hand before that. Most of the babies were re reunited with their parents with the use of the wireless. The first fatalities were four crew members who lost their lives in the area where the fire started. The first passenger fatalities were those in the lifeboats that were unsuccessfully launched and those who jumped overboard before the rescue ships had arrived. In total, 136 perished, 521 were rescued. Before leaving the Volturno, Captain Inch tried to sink the ship by opening the sea valves, but found it impossible. He could not get anywhere near the engine room. For four days, the charred remains floated dangerously in the ocean. On October 17, she was sighted by the Charlois, a Dutch oil tanker. The captain of the tanker did, know of, did not know about the Volturno disaster. So he came upon her at night in the darkness, still seeing flames, thinking there might be survivors aboard. So he lowered a boat and hovered near it. No voices were heard. At dawn, crew members from the tanker boarded the ship. It did not take long for them to see what had happened. Every scrap of wood on the ship had been burned. The decks had fallen through. The heat and heaps of melted metal were all that remained. The crew opened the seacocks then and the outer circulation tubes and water poured in and the vessel sank slowly beneath the water. She came to rest 600 miles from the Titanic. After the rescue of the Volturno's crew and passengers, the rescue vessels resumed their original destinations on either side of the Atlantic. The rescue was successful, but there was no possibility of sorting out the passengers into their families. Thus, there were many separations. Fathers, mothers, and children found themselves on different ships, headed for different ports, not knowing if their loved ones had survived. One of the children from the Grunewald family was separated from the others and ended up in France. They were able to identify who he was because he spoke Dutch. And they checked the manifest and sent him back to Rotterdam. He was later reunited with his family on another ship. Due to the organization of the Uranian Steepshin Company, along with charitable societies in the different ports, families did get reunited. Upon arriving in America, the Volturno passengers were not required to go through the immigration process on Ellis Island, but were examined by immigration officials on the ships they arrived on. In America, the Red Cross and other relief organizations 
were prepared for the immigrants even before they arrived. $6,521.64 was raised in contributions and $5,000 was donated by the Red Cross Relief Fund. The D. Groot Gruneveld family was given number 86 as their case number and were awarded $336.44. Other relief organizations provided clothing, towels, bedding, and temporary housing for the rescued. It could be stated that there were many heroes of this disaster, including Captain Inch, his officers, who fought to keep the passengers safe. The cook who kept baking and providing food and coffee to all aboard right to the end. The rescue ships and the crews that answered the SOS calls and saved so many people. The oil tanker and crew that responded and kept pumping the heavy oil around the Volturno until everyone was off. And Marconi, the inventor of the wireless and its operators who kept sending messages for help Without the wireless, there would have been no survivors. I would like to share a little bit with you about the DeGroote family. There's a chart that I have put together back there uh, with the, the display of the family history. My great-grandfather was a doctor in Holland and was a physician for the Queen of Holland. He was the husband of Anna Jacobs, a passenger of the Volturno but had passed away before her immigration to America. Accompanying her, her, her mom was my grandfather's sister, Anna Marie, and her four children. Both my great-grandfather and great-grandmother were previously married, and with both their spouses passing away. Great-grandpa had five children in his first marriage, with one of them being a priest. There is a saying, Blood is thicker than water. With the De Groot Grunewald family, but his blood is extremely thick. My grandfather married Hendriga Grunewald. His sister Anna married Floris Grunewald. A sister and a brother married a brother and a sister. <laughs> as a young man in Holland, my grandfather served as a, as a guard for the queen. There's a picture of him on the family poster back there in his uniform. Grandpa and Grandma were married on May 9, 1906 in The Hague, South Holland. He immigrated to America shortly after the wedding and made his way to Norway where he found work in the mines. He then sent for Grandma. After she arrived in Norway, they started a small farm which Grandma mostly worked although I do have a picture of Grandpa milking cows. I remember their small barn with five cows, a couple of pigs, and some chickens. They operated a small dairy farm business. As the children got older, they delivered the milk to customers in the Nor Norway area. I remember my dad telling me that the, in the winter, they would pull, pull, pull a sleigh, and in the summer, they would use wagons to do the delivery. The milk was in one and two quart aluminum pails with covers on them. Later, they used the quart glass bottles. As I grew up, we always had milk from the barn. There also was a large garden behind the barn that was put to good use for feeding the large family of six boys and three girls. There was a small one-room building on the property which was called the milk house or summer kitchen. Grandma took care of the milk there. I remember the bottles of milk with one third top being rich golden cream. I got my chance to give my arms a good workout, churning butter for Grandma and Grandpa. But most of all, I remember how clean and sanitary that little room was. Every day when the work was done, Grandma would wash and hose everything down. I still remember the bleach. My grandparents were such hard workers. Grandma spoke very little English, but Grandpa loved to talk. I remember him talking about the boat disaster and about his dad being a doctor. Every lunch and dinner meal we had there always began with a bowl of soup. No matter what the main course was, you had to have the bowl of soup first. Some of the foods I remember were Balkan rye, head cheese, 
apple tart. And on Christmas Eve, we had a treat called Ole Ballin, which was a big fat round donut with currants, deep fried and rolled in cinnamon sugar. Christmas was the only time we were allowed in the front room or the living room. We always stayed in the kitchen when visiting. Grandma and Grandpa had a gift for everyone at Christmas. They would have a Santa come to give out the gifts. The females got a box of handkerchiefs and the males got socks. Every year we knew what we were going to get because every year we got the same thing. Santa was really my Uncle Bill, the oldest of the Degru boys. We all knew who he was, but we played along and Grandma and Grandpa would laugh and laugh. Grandma and Grandpa were able to celebrate their 50th wedding anniversary. The family gave them a big party with lots of friends and family there. Grandma passed away one month later. Grandpa lived to be a ripe old age of 95. I want to thank, thank the Jake Mingini Museum for this opportunity to research the information on the Volturno sinking, which gave me the opportunity to research the group Gurneveld family history. There is much information to be found by using the computer, especially if you're using a lot of they have a lot of old newspaper article, articles. I want to put up a special thank to Mike Vanderweelen, a descendant of my great grandmother's first marriage, and my cousin Wally's oldest son, who has been researching the family history. And I want to add a special thank you to my children who helped me nav navigate through all the information we found and then helped to organize it. Thank you, Jeanette. That was great, great, excellent, whatever. Okay, I'm going to talk about a few of the survivors of the Volturno disaster. I'm very humbled to be here to talk to you about my grandmother, Anna Marie Benabelt, and her mother, Anna Marie de Groot, my great grandmother, and Anna Grenabelt's four young sons and their harrowing experience on one of the history's great shipping disasters. I thank all who made this possible, especially Rosemary Van Pembroke. She connected all the dots for us to be here. Without all of you, this would not have been possible, even though this isn't the big movie I dreamt about from my childhood. <laughs> the oral tradition came down to my four brothers and I from our grandma Grenevelt, to my mother, Anna Gertrude Grenevelt Lee, she was their first baby born in America, December 27, 1914. The disaster was 13 and she was born in 14. And their first daughter. My mother married my father, Kenneth Quinton Lee, and he worked for the Ford Motor Company in Kingsford, where we lived one and a half blocks away. My father died at the plant of a massive coronary at the age of 47, September 2nd, 1948. I was eight years old. <coughs> Floris and Anna Grinneveld had 16 children, four girls and 12 sons. Boys outnumbered girls in our family all around. <laughs> I grew up with my grandmother and great-grandmother's story about the boat that was on fire when they came to America. I knew they came from the Netherlands or Holland and they spoke Dutch. I can only imagine how difficult it must have been for my grandparents and great-grandmother to adjust to a new language here in America. I remember going to my great-grandparents' farm in Norway when I was young, along with my four brothers, in my father's small Ford car. Grandma Grenevelt would call me Kettle because she couldn't pronounce the word Carol. She could not say my name Carol is Kettle. So I was kind of amused by that and I chuckled inside and I just smiled. 
But I would tell my classmates in school that my grandmother came from Holland and she called me Kettle because she couldn't say my name too well yet. We grew up with a few Dutch words in our daily life. My mother would say, go, get me the velvet. That was Dutch for the dust carrier or holder, dustpan in our language. Or go get your coat in the Holocaust, which is the closet. You knew it. <laughs> zak was a favorite word. She often would say, quit your zocking. Is that all you do is zock, zock, zock? <laughs> which means whine or whining. <laughs> When our first Dutch relative visited, uh, visitor came in 1967, his first comment was, with the copas, as he looked at our kids, which meant white heads, blonde hair, white blonde hair. My mother taught us one sentence in Dutch. And if we wanted something to, uh, sweet or had a toothache, she would say, oh, track your candidant oit, which meant extract or take out your candy tooth or sweet tooth. My mother has said her parents came from two different areas of Holland. Her father came from the northern part and spoke with kind of a German dialect. And her mother was from the southern part and spoke with a French dialect. My mother's oldest brother, Flores, was always, always called Flotcha, and she was called Antcha, after their parents, that, which means little Flores and little Anna, because her parents were Flores and Anna, okay? So then, um, oh gee, what did I do here? <laughs> oh, Tanta meant auntie, or auntie, and Om meant uncle, we always talked about uh, Oma women, Tanda Didige. And Dumda uh, Ap meant Dum Ape or something like that. And Snutklu meant a nosy person. There's a few of the words that I was able to retain to my old age. The oral tradition of the Volturna within the family went like this. The Volturno got its name from the Volturno River in Italy. Cause of fire, and uh, Grenoble said the rumor aboard the ship at that time was that the fire was started by a man who was smoking in bed where they kept the sick. So there's a lot of rumors of why that uh, ship fire started. The captain of the ship, they did not call him by his name, Captain Inch, just Captain. Grandma Grenoble told this story over and over again. The captain of the ship carried a pistol and he was ready to use it if anyone got out of order or out of control if they didn't obey orders. This disaster was so terrible that she seriously considered jumping in the water. She said that she would look at the water thinking it would be better to drown than to die by fire. But she looked back at her family and couldn't do it. Their feet were so hot and the shoes were almost burning. At one point, Anna Grenevelt tied her six-month-old baby John to her body and didn't look at him for almost three days, according to tradition. She didn't think he was alive when they were finally rescued. When she checked on him, he was very much alive. Sad to say that baby John died on January 19th. 1914. So this happened in October and he died that January. Four and a half year old Flores suffered from seizure disorders, epilepsy. I can't imagine how hard this disaster was on him. My grandmother said in Holland there was a man who was a spiritual healer. 
He would go in a room with Flores and pray over him for hours. When the healer came out, he was dripping with sweat. She said Flores was getting better. The spiritual healer told my grandmother that when she gets to America to find a person like him to help Flores. This was before there was any medications for seizure disorders to help Flores. She did not find anybody like that man in Holland. Now William, or Willem, the second son, was three years, four months old. Get it, the third son was one year, nine months. Then she had baby John, six months, okay? At that time, William, or Wim as we call him, was the son who got lost during the rescue. My great-grandmother, Anna de Groot, and grandmother, uh, Anna Grenneveld, were extremely upset and worried about this. They didn't know if Wim was living or dead. <coughs> the following is a New York Times story. When the survivors of the Volturno arrived in New York, many people were there to meet the people on the Croon land. That was the ship that they were rescued by, the Croon land. And with all the help possible, Captain Inch was on that ship too. They were all hurting with burns to their bodies, their clothes and shoes, and they were half out of their minds, not knowing what would happen next. They did not go to Ellis Island. The immigration officers came uh, aboard the Croon Land when it had been warped into her berth at the foot of West 21st Street. The survivors of the Volturno were called into the smoking room of the steamship, where they filed one by one before the immigration officers to give their names and brief sketches of their personal history. The women came first. The majority of them were separated from their husbands and in some cases from their children. The scene was full of human interest of a very pathetic nature. As the names were called out, an agent of the company <coughs> of an, um, and an official from the Hebrew Sheltering and Immigration Aid Society stood beside the inspector to act as interpreters to tell the women if they had any news uh, that they might have received of the rescue of the other members of their families. Another story was, lost one child, saved three. This was a separate story in the New York Times. Mrs. Anna de Groot from Holland and her daughter Anna Grenneveld and the latter's four children were lured over the side of the Volturno shortly after seven o'clock on Friday morning, after the deck of the vessel had become so heated that it was almost impossible to stand in one place for any length of time. The six were lowered into lifeboats of the croon land with ropes fastened around their waist in the form of a noose. William, three years, four months, was drowned. The rope which he had been placed, which had been placed around his waist, slipped and he fell into the water. Sailors jumped to his rescue, but he did not reappear. Mrs. De Groot was hysterical and showed plainly her nervous strain. The grandmother, daughter, and grandchildren were going to Norway, Michigan where they will join the daughter's husband, Floris Grinneveld, a farmer, dairy farmer too, uh, of that place. He also worked in the mines. And that was the end of this story. Now Anna de Groot and Anna Grinneveld and the three boys were brought to a hospital right away because one of the boys was sick. And we're not too sure, was it Floris? 
or was it John? A mystery was a mystery to us. After that short stay in the hospital, they went to stay with a very nice Jewish family until they found out if Wim was living or dead. According to oral tradition, there was a picture taken of each group rescued that went to other countries and sent to New York. These pictures didn't come all together, but one at a time, so my grandmother and Anna Grinnebelt would hopefully open and look at each picture as they came, until there was only one more to come. She waited anxiously for it, and when it finally came, she was afraid to open it for fear he was not on in it. When she finally opened it, there he was, right in the front row. He was rescued by the French ship La Touraine after they figured out who he was. He was sent to Rotterdam and put on the ship uh, Uranium. And then William left Rotterdam once again and went to Nova Scotia and down to New York. He arrived on uh, the 1st of uh, November, 1913. This was our answer to one of the mysteries of the lost boy. How long did they stay in New York before they returned William? He was treated very well, given clothes and money, $20 from what I understand. And needless to say, his mother and grandmother were filled with gratitude and joy. Well, almost. William's mother also was very upset with him. He didn't want to drink his milk. He wanted wine to drink instead. <laughs> and also he was swearing. Three-year-old, pretty good. So we all said the sailors had a ball with him. <laughs> It took a while to get him back to tr on track, though. Anna de Groot and Anna Grenneveld and boys were treated very well. They were given clothes, shoes, money. Each adult got a little over $300. One oral story about their stay was that they were served sweet potatoes to eat at one of their meals. Well, they never saw or ate them before. They didn't know what they were. Were they frozen potatoes? Or were they rotten potatoes? The two Annas were very insulted. They did not eat them. So Anna Marie de Groot was a widow when she came to America. Her husband, Dr. William de Groot, was one of the Queen's Wilhelmina's doctors. He delivered babies. He probably was an obstetrician. We all have people we call heroes in our lives. Anna Marie de Groot, age 54, truly, and Anna Marie Grenneveld, age 24, were truly two of my heroes. In closing, I thank God for the gifts of life and faith that carried us through generations of joys and difficulties and sorrows, which have strengthened us to make our world better. I have to make this quote from the book of Genesis, uh, chapter 1, verses 27 and 28. God created man in his image. In the divine image, he created them. God blessed them, saying, Be fertile and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Our family tree certainly did this. <laughs>